Welcome to today's class. Title of today's lecture is the trachea. And our study content as follows. We have the definition, the functions of the trachea, the relations, different regions that they present, the structural components, blood supply, and the clinical anatomy. The trachea is also known as the windpipe. It is a fibrocartilage structure, which means that it is made up of fibrous membrane and also cartilage. So it extends between the cyst cervical vertebra to the level of T4, T5 thoracic vertebra. And this is where it tends to bifurcate into two to supply the two lungs. So you see it extending from the precoit cartilage the cricoid cartilage basically is the cartilage that forms the inferior border of the larynx. So it's like, like the terminal end of the larynx. That is where the trachea then begins from. It then goes down to the level of the T4, T5 thoracic vertebra, where it finally bifurcates into two. It is about 12 cm in length and about 2.5 centimeter in diameter. Trachea presents a form of flexibility. It tends to be twistable and stretchable. And this could be attributed to its structural components. Because what the trachea is made up of, if this structure can present a form of flexibility, then we can say that the trachea itself could present the same form of presentation. The relationship between the trachea, the pharynx, and the larynx. Let's look at this internal presentation around the cervical and the thoracic region. We have the nasal cavity somewhere here. We have the oral cavity, and we have the larynx. The pharynx is located behind the nasal cavity, the oral cavity, and the larynx. So this area that is dotted is the pharynx. We have this as the nasopharynx, we have this as the oropharynx, and we have this as the laryngopharynx. These names are carved out due to the structures located anterior to them. The nasopharynx is the part of the pharynx that is located behind the nasal cavity, while the oropharynx is located behind the oral cavity. And this is the laryngopharynx, which is the region of the pharynx that is located behind the larynx. So we have the pharynx extending through from the nasal cavity down. The larynx is located somewhere around here, just at the junction between the oropharynx. The larynx presents a form of structure at its superior boundary, which is called the epiglottis. This epiglottis has a characteristic to flip down and flip backwards. Let's make a practical illustration. Let's say that the hair that is inhaled through the nose wrist goes into the nasal cavity goes behind into the nasopharynx, goes down into the oropharynx. This air needs to cross to this edge. And as soon as this comes, the epiglottis opens up so that the hair can move through, through the larynx, then go down to the trachea, then to the lungs. But let's look at it the other way around. Let's say we put food substance into the mouth. The food substance goes into the oropharynx, when it gets to this junction, the epiglottis closes so as to prevent the passage of food substances into the larynx. So this is directed from the oropharynx. It goes down to the laryngopharynx, then it enters into the esophagus, then it goes down to the stomach. So you can see the configuration. You have the larynx as a gadget top here that tends to control the passage of air into the larynx. Then inferior to the larynx, you have the trachea. While behind the trachea, you have the esophagus. The trachea actually can be physically examined 
by touching the anterior midline plane of the neck, you can feel the alignment of the C-ring cartilages. That is the general relationship between the trachea, the larynx, and the pharynx. The functions of the trachea. We've said that it allows hair to be rooted into the two lungs because there's a point it gets to, which is the T4, T5 thoracic vertebra where it bifurcates into two to supply hair into the two lungs. It also presents some form of functions that are attributed to the type of epithelium that it is lined with. We know that the trachea is lined with a ciliated pseudostructified columnar epithelium. This epithelium are embedded with goblet cell. If you look at this structure, you see goblet cells embedded within the epithelium. These goblet cells are responsible for the secretion of mucus. The mucus that is secreted allows the protection of the surface epithelium and also lubrication. It also helps to create a sticky environment so as to help trap foreign bodies or dust. Also, the cilia, due to its flipping action, it helps to sweep out foreign bodies from the lumen of the trachea. So as they are flipping forward and backward, they are helping to push out foreign bodies that find their way into the trachea. The regions of the trachea, we have two basic regions. We have the cervical region, which is the part that begins from the cricoid cartilage down to the superior thoracic inlet. This is the neck region. Please don't mind the diagram. Let's focus. This is where the thorax begins from. So we have the superior thoracic inlet. So the cervical region begins from the inferior border of the cricoid cartilage down to the superior thoracic inlet. We also have the thoracic region, which begins from the superior thoracic inlet down to the level of T4, T5 thoracic vertebra, where it bifurcates into two to supply the two lungs. The structural component of the trachea. Trachea is made up of four basic components. And the first one is the cartilages. Those are the C-ring cartilages. We have the elastic fibrous membrane. We have the smooth muscle and we have the epithelium. So we are going to be building the trachea in an artistic fashion. So we are going to take the individual structural component as the raw material that we need to build a finished product that is called the trachea. So follow suit and enjoy this lecture to see how we finally produce a trachea. The cartilages are C-shaped, which means that they are deficient at the back. We need about 16 to 20 of them to build the trachea. The type of cartilage that is needed an island type of cartilage. So how are they arranged? We have the cartilages put one on top of each other. You can see them one on top of each other like that. But the configuration in the anterior view and posterior view are different. So the C-ring cartilages are placed in such a way that the covering hand is placed in the anterior direction, while the open hand is placed at the back. And that is why when you do a physical examination, you can actually feel the close end of the serial cartilages in the anterior midline of the neck. So the cartilages are placed one on top of each other. So the second structure that we have listed that is needed for the production of the trachea is the elastic fibrous membrane. We need two types of elastic fibrous membrane. We need the thin elastic fibrous membrane and we need a thick elastic fibrous membrane. Thickness basically is needed for covering. It's needed for protection. So the thicker layer will be placed on the outside of the serine cartilages while the thinner layer will be placed in the interior walls 
of the ceramic cartilages. So this is how they are arranged. The thick elastic fibrous membrane plays on the outer surface of the ceramic cartilage, while we have the thin elastic fibrous membrane placed on the inner surface of the ceramic cartilage. When they get to the superior border of the ceramic cartilage, the two membrane merge to become one and they tend to run a short distance. When they run a short distance, they open up to receive another serine cartilage. And we have the thick layer following suit to run over the outer surface of the second cartilage, while the thinner layer runs the inner surface of the serine cartilage. And when they get to the superior border of the second cartilage, they also merge to become one and they run a short distance. After running a short distance, they open up again to receive another serine cartilage. So that is how the elastic fibrous membrane comes into play. So that's the kind of presentation that they have in the formation of the trachea. The third structure is the trachealis muscle. Remember that we say that the serine cartilages are deficient at the posterior end, so it is open. Since this structure will be carrying hair and we see that the posterior end is opened, definitely hair will be leaking out through this space if it is not covered. So that is why we have the trachealis muscle coming into play by filling up the posterior end of the serine cartilage. So this is where they are actually placed. They tend to fill the gap between the open end of the serine cartilage. You see them at the posterior region of the trachea because this end is actually directed towards the posterior part. Because it's a smooth type of muscle, they allow a form of stretching. During intratracheal pressure, it allows expansion for the trachea to accommodate the intratracheal pressure. The last structure is the epithelium. And the type of epithelium that would need to produce a trachea is a ciliated to the stratified columnar epithelium that are embedded goblet cell. Structures are not just lined with epithelium. They are lined based on the functions that they would be presenting as it relates to the function of that organ. So this cilia, we've said that they flip forward and backward, which helps to repel or sweep out foreign bodies that finds their way into the lumen of the trachea. And we also have the goblet cell that tends to secrete mucus. And this mucus creates a form of sticky environment so that dust and foreign bodies can be trapped easily within the lumen of the trachea. Blood supply. The trachea is supplied by the inferior thyroid artery. But let's see what gives birth to this inferior thyroid artery because blood supply generally are very interesting in anatomy to redirect the branches back to the origin. From the heart of aorta, we have three emergence. We have the left subclavian artery, we have the left common carotid, and we have the brachiocephalic trunk. This brachiocephalic trunk further divides into the right common carotid and the right subclavian. So you still have the subclavian on the right, the subclavian on the left, and you have the common carotid on the right, you have the common carotid on the left. It's just that on the right side, instead of giving off two here, it gives off one, which will further divide into the two that we have on the left. So we have the subclavian and we have the right common carotid. What we are concerned with is the subclavian. Subclavian basically from the name subclavian below the clavicle. So it supplies branches to the upper limb, but it gives a tyrocervical trunk, which further gives branches. And one of the branches that it gives is the inferior thyroid artery that supplies the trachea. So the inferior thyroid artery that supplies the trachea, if you want to trace it backwards, you can say that is one of the branches of the tyrocervical trunk and the tyrocervical trunk is a branch of the subclavian and the subclavian branches from this brachiocephalic trunk on the right and the brachiocephalic trunk 
is a branch from the arc of aorta. So that is the way it goes. We could have trachitis. Trachitis is an inflammation of the trachea and it could result from infection or disease. Trachitis can lead to stenosis, which means the narrowing of the canal. When there is swelling and when there is increase in size, it tends to reduce the canal. So trachitis can lead to stenosis, which is narrowing. Also tracheal stenosis could occur as a result of congenital abnormality. If you look at our lecture on developmental anatomy, you will see that tubular structures undergo a canalization, which is the loss of cell within the region where the canal will be created. And if there is no complete loss of cell, the lumen would be smaller. We could have tracheosophageal fistula. This is a congenital abnormality which occur during the development of form. And this occur when you have the oesophagus being connected to the trachea. Remember when we discussed about the relationship between the trachea, the pharynx, the oesophagus, and the larynx. We say that the oesophagus is located behind the trachea. And that is why you can do a physical examination of the trachea in the anterior midline of the neck. During the development of form, these structures originate from a single primitive tube, which finally divides. But if there is an incomplete division, that means a part of the esophagus is connected to the trachea, which means that food substance will find its way into the lungs. We could also have trachomalacia. This is fluffiness or softness of the tracheal cartilages. And this tends to create collapse in the wall of the trachea. It is actually a bad defect, but could also result from smoking or other form of injury. This is an exercise for us to tackle. And the question says that using your knowledge on the morphology of the trachea, explain the reason or reasons behind the flexibility of the trachea. We've said that the trachea presents some form of flexibility. It is stretchable. Would this be as a result of its structural components? Please, let's go through this. And if we are able to answer this, it sure means that we have understood this lecture to some extent. So thank you for watching. Let's stay tuned for more content.